Hey, y'all. It's a special episode of the Rose Chat Podcast as we kick off our 10th season of Exploring the World of Roses. Today, Connie Hilker and her new book, Heritage Roses, a collection of essays and lessons. Now, we'll hear about the book, plus we'll have a very special presentation that Connie gave in Gainesville, Florida, on the history of Heritage Roses. Now, Connie's been collecting and preserving Heritage Roses since 2002. Her collection of stories follows that journey from amateur rose rustler to nursery owner, writer, consultant, and lecturer who concentrates on the history of Heritage Roses and their suitability in today's gardens. You'll also find one of what I think is the best guide on how to propagate roses for cuttings. So y'all stay tuned. The Rose Chat Podcast starts now. It's time for the Rose Chat Podcast, a podcast dedicated to celebrating the world's most beloved flower, the rose. Join award-winning gardeners Chris Van Cleef and Teresa Byington as they chat with rose lovers and experts from around the globe. With each episode, you'll gain valuable knowledge and insights to achieve the rose garden you've always dreamed of. Listen now as we explore the world of roses. Try Haven Brand Soil Conditioners, providing generations of gardeners with a truly all-natural alternative to chemical fertilizers with their line of composted manure and alfalfa teas. Easy to brew and use on all indoor and outdoor plants. Find them online at manuretea.com. Hey, Connie, you've written a book since the last time you were on Rose Chat. I did. So how'd that come about? I have, I have just about always written, and most of the things that I write are articles for newsletters or journals or even blog posts for many, many years. And I've had the idea of putting all of that into one spot, but then just never did anything about it. And finally... Over the summer, I took the time to review all of the articles that I thought would make a good book, and they're all updated with lots more pretty pictures than I could put into a print publication, and the result was this book. We titled it Heritage Roses because that's really what it is, and that's, that's my first love, so it seems just call it what it is. You represent those heritage roses very well. Tell us a little bit about what we'll find in the book. It's each, each chapter in the book is a standalone story. So it's not as if you have to sit and read the entire thing cover to cover. But I know a lot of people that have done that so far. But it has, it starts out with a story of how I got to be a plant rustler because I started out not rustling roses, but up rustling other plants. And then roses came into it later. And then we talk about the mechanics of just a, how do you take cuttings and how do you root roses from cuttings? And what are some stories about where some of these roses have been found? And it's just, it's a storybook more than anything. Oh, and the stories are so interesting. I know our friends are going to want to have a copy. So how can they purchase it? It's available on Amazon. So the easiest thing ever um, from Amazon.com can search my name, Connie Hilker, and the, um, the, the order page will come up. Perfect. You know, I ordered a book and I have a funny story. You want to hear my funny story? Of course I do. Well, I ordered it on Amazon and you know how Amazon things come very quickly and I expected it in a day or two, but it didn't come and it didn't come. So a week or more later, I received a call and found out it was delivered to my daughter in England. So by mistake, her address was chosen. I have a, I have an, a UK account as well as a US account for some reason. In this transaction, her address was chosen by mistake, so it did take a bit longer to arrive, and the delivery charge was a little different, too. Oh, dear. Oh, that is funny. (laughs) Isn't that just the best story? So, Connie, you're now in England, and my daughter has a wonderful book. Yay. So, it's a win-win. I agree. (laughs) Connie, the book is fantastic. It's informative. And it's practical, 
It's for all ro- rose lovers or even people new to roses. And it's beautiful, especially the back cover. Oh, thank you. I, I really adore the photographer. <laughs> when I said cheese, I had no idea that we were going to capture that beautiful image of you. It's absolutely perfect. And it even has you wearing your amazing boots. Yay, my, the, my colorful rose cowboy boots. They're my favorites. So there you are, just surrounded by what you love. You're taking rose cuttings in a beautiful garden and sharing with others. So it is a great capture. It was the, it was the prelude to a really wonderful afternoon um, doing the propagation clinic with your Rose Society at that meeting that afternoon. Was just, there's so many lovely people who were so eager to learn what I had to teach them. It was great. It was. We're still talking about it. And I, one of the things about your book that I think is going to inspire is for others to do some rose wrestling, too. Wouldn't that be great? Oh, of course, of course, because anything that we can do to, to light the fire of, pres- of preservation with people who wouldn't normally be inclined to do that is always good. <laughs> so true. And I can't talk about rose wrestling without remembering the story that we've both heard many times about Barbara's pasture rose. Do you want to tell a little bit about that story? Oh, yes, yes, yes. It is. It's a classic rose wrestling story. The way I remember it is that Barbara Oliva was familiar with a rose that was growing in a pasture along a country road in North. It was in Northern California, I believe, because that's where she lived. And stopped her car and went through the tall grass and through a barbed wire fence, I believe, to take cuttings of this rose that was growing in the wild in this pasture. (laughs) She was not dressed for taking rose cuttings and walking through a pasture, but she did. And now we have the famous Barbara's Pasture Rose, a beautiful rose. And, you know, as I remember, the end of that story is maybe it was even less than a year later as she was traveling by that same location, it had been developed and that rose was gone and would have been lost. And I'm sure they've come up with what the actual name of the rose is, but it's it's fondly known as Barbara's Pasture Rose and it's beautiful. Yeah, I don't know of and I don't know of anyone yet who's tried to put an actual cultivar name on that rose. We just call it Barbara's Pasture Rose because that preserves the story. And the end of that story with the original plant being destroyed by development is all too familiar. And it's happened to me a few times, both in cemeteries and um, old home sites. And just it just happened to me yesterday. What a you know, what a coincidence that you brought that up in this story. Steve and I went for a ride to check on a rose that I knew about that was down in it was about an hour from me. It was given to me by a friend back in the early 2000s, and we identified it as Shaler's Provence, and it's since become one of my very favorite roses and one of the few that I grow multiples of. But this one, he collected as cuttings from a cemetery in Essex County, and I saw it in 2008. He and I were on a ride, and we went to go see this plant, and it was still there in 2008, and I'd not been back since. Well, Steve and I went for a ride yesterday and said, let's go to Essex and check and see if this rose is still at the cemetery. And it's not. It, all traces of it are completely gone. Mm. But it doesn't exist in the cemetery anymore. But it does exist in gardens because my friend took cuttings that day, and that saved it. See, there's so many beautiful stories out there, um, you know, of people who have, um, unbeknownst to themselves, preserved something that would have been lost and something beautiful is now still in cultivation. I just love those stories. I never tire of them. And for as long as I've been gardening, which is forever, um, I've been interested in what was on the roadside. Maybe it wasn't a rose, but often I would have Mr. G stop so I could go dig something up. And I was always ill prepared for such a thing until you told me about your kit. So tell our listeners about your kit. 
I spread I spread the news of my cutting kit to anyone who will listen. It's the most compact and easy to put together bag of stuff. Mine's just in a canvas gardening bag that I keep in the back of my car. But it has everything that I can think of that I would need if I come across a plant out in the wild. So first thing would be pruners and gloves because often they're roses and roses have thorns. We need gloves. Um, paper towels to wrap the cuttings in, a notebook and a pen, and labels. I usually wrap a label in there with where I got it. Um, bug repellent, because often it's tall grass, and in season we have ticks and nasty bugs. Um, a spade, in case, I, in case there is something that needs to be dug up instead of, uh, instead of taking cuttings. Plastic bags. That's all I can think of off the top of my head. Well, it absolutely is so worth having. You know, most gardeners, um, you know, there's even stories of little old ladies who had little snips in their purses when they would go to rose shows or, or <laughs> rose society, garden tours, or even public gardens. You know, um, rose growers are famous for taking snips of things. So you've got us totally prepared. And it looks in a, in a, in a can, uh, all put together in a bag like that, it looks kind of professional. And you, if you have to go out and do it when you shouldn't be, people never question. It looks like you're, <laughs> it just looks like you're working. <laughs> but most people are very accommodating to those kinds of things because they want the history to be preserved as well. Um, agreed. Anyone that I have talked to about this is always happy to share cuttings. And they especially feel complimented because... I'm showing interest in, in this plant. So whenever I ask someone, I compliment the plant, tell them how, you know, how rare it is or how good it is, and ask if they would share, and I've never been refused. And I bet along the way you've heard a lot of great stories. Um, it's rare that I find stories about the roses themselves because most of them are out in, um, in abandoned locations. But I hear about family. I hear family stories. There was one where it was a Dr. Van Fleet and the man I was talking to still recalls decades later wrestling with his brother on the front porch and falling into his grandmother's Dr. Van Fleet that grew right beside the porch. So that was a very memorable and a very painful encounter. <laughs> oh, Connie, I love your stories. I'm so glad you're preserving them in a book, and just as you preserve so many beautiful roses for us to enjoy. So, congratulations. Well done. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Teresa. I really appreciate it. Next, we join Connie as she presents to a group of rose enthusiasts in Gainesville, Florida. She's going to take us on a journey from medieval times right up to today. Let's listen in. I started growing roses back in the early 2000s because up until then I lived in the shade and we know that roses and shade don't really mix and once I got nine acres of sunshine in an old house with good soil I started buying roses and the collection kind of got out of control but I ended up specializing in the older ones because I'm a history freak. Um, family history, U.S. history, Virginia history, and rose history. It's all absolutely fascinating. I quit reading fiction quite a few years ago Give me nonfiction, especially stories, true stories, um, and I'm the happiest girl ever. So um, history and roses go well together. And we're going to start with the cover rose. Rosa? Yellica? Officinalis. Mm. Apothecary's rose. Middle Ages. It's still grown today. All right, what's an old garden rose? This is what the American Rose Society tells you that an old garden rose is. And for classification purposes, we have to have a line in the sand. We've got full garden roses before this. We have modern roses after this. But you look at this, it's like, um, that was more than a century ago. So the modern roses actually do have a lot of catching up to go because we have many centuries of old garden roses. For this program, I divided it into three parts. We have the older European roses, most of which, I'm sorry, Florida, bloom once. There are some that don't. 
We have the Asian roses that came in the 18th century and caused a sensation. And then we have the hybrids, that the hybridizers got hold of the uh, Europeans and the Asians and started to do their thing. Here's the major classes of old garden roses. And these are in approximately chronological order. So the gallicas, the damasks, albas, centifolias, and the moss roses. I start with the gallicas because they are the oldest class of rose. They're known all the way back into the Middle Ages. Um, they're smaller plants. For me in Virginia, my gallicas rarely get to thigh high. Um, they bloom only in the spring, extremely, extremely fragrant. And the thing about the gallicas are they originated the colors that modern hybridizers have been desperately trying to breathe into modern roses. The hot pinks, the lavenders, the mauves, the shades with the mauve and the blue, and the great purple are all in the gallicas. Here we have Bell Isis. Connie told us about Bell Isis earlier today. It was what David Austin used to produce constant spry. And by the way, I grow dainty made also simply because it combined with Bell Isis to make constant spry. Um, Bell Isis is a little taller than most gallicas. Mine's about yet. The shades of pink in the flowers are unbelievable, and the fragrance will absolutely knock you over. Here we have elegant Gallica. Uh, Ralph mentioned my love of found roses, and I think it goes along with my love of history because for whatever reason, somebody in history planted roses or whatever other garden plant in a location, oh, I swear, for us to find later. This was found at the Garden at Wick, which is a home in Germantown outside of Pennsylvania. It has the distinction of having the most oldest, most intact garden in the whole United States. It dates from the 1820s and it's still in its original form. It was restored based on old notes and Leonie Bell did some work there and she found the elegant Gallica. Do not know what it was and she's the one who gave it that name, but we do know it dates from at least the 1820s. La Belle Sultane. I love this rose beyond love. Um, some of you here already know my love of single and semi-double roses, and the color of this rose in the sunshine is absolutely electric blue magenta. It is the most striking color, and the contrast between it and the yellow stamens, you just want to stand there and stare at it, and then you catch the fragrance. And Tuscany support. This one, um, there was an older rose called Tuscany, which was semi-double, and Tuscany Superb blooms more. And it's just an all around healthier rose. And it's also one where if you leave it unattended, it will attempt to eat you in your house because it suckers like <laughs> almost no other. And here we have St. Nicholas, which I don't think is available anymore. I had it in my garden, I loved it, and I lost it. I got it from Pickering years ago when they had that wonderful, wonderful collection of roses up there. Um, that's exactly what it looked like. The flowers opened in reflex, it had the speckles, and it was a spectacular plant. And I've been trying to find it, and I can't. So make notes. If you find anybody that grows St. Nicholas, call me. And then we have damasks. Um, this is where DNA studies come in really, really handy. Because up until now, all we've really been able to do is just sort of guess about where some of these roses came from. But this one truly is believed to have been a, combina a combination, whether it was intentional or accidental, between Gallica and Rosa Phoenicia. And it originated in Persia, brought to Europe by the Crusaders. So you know how old this cultivated, these cultivated roses are. Medium to large plants. We're getting larger as we go. The gallicas were down here. The centifolias can be anywhere from this high to up here. Um, and there's, these are shades of pink or white. They can usually medium pink to kind of pale pink to white, but not, not a whole lot of range in that. With matte foliage, very, very, very fragrant, which is the reason that they were cultivated 
because this is where the old rose fragrance in products has historically come from. And there was an entire industry devoted to doing nothing but extracting that from rose petals, from damask roses. And we have autumn damask, which does repeat. It blooms very, very well in the spring. And it repeats modestly, sparingly, um, later in the summer and into fall. In my garden, it's a very awkward plant. We'll just say it's got an architectural presence. <laughs> it, um, it tends to call attention to itself because it is kind of stiff and awkward and gangly. But then, as all visitors do in the garden, people lean over and smell. And that's when autumn damask gains its, gains its followers. Here we have belladonna. Um, don't exactly know when, but we know this is before 1840 because that was when it was first documented. Um, beautiful pink, matte foliage, extremely disease resistant until late summer. It's almost as if the disease pressure catches up with it and then the leaves all get spotty and fall off. But at that point, it's already surrounded by other things in my garden, so it doesn't really matter. Celsiana is incredibly graceful. The plant itself is beautiful, even when it's not in bloom. And the thing about Celsiana's flowers are, they are just that filmy and silky and graceful. And Ispahan. Um, Ispahan is a feature of where we are. You can grow once blooming old garden roses. Everyone grows Ispahan because it is just that good of a plant. And then we have Lita. Painted damask. That photo is not altered at all. It always looks like that. Snowy white with the violet edges on the flowers. It's absolutely stunning. But it's a relatively short plant, so you have to bend over to smell it. But it's, it's worth the trip, I promise. <laughs> and then we get into the albas. Um, these did. They have done DNA studies, and it did it did come from some sort of damask and Rosa canina. Um, it was grown by the they grown by the Romans, so we we have lots of references to the Romans growing roses and using roses ceremonially and as decoration. So albas would have been some of them. They're very tall plants, often stiff, um, not really good for climbing, but that's great because they self support them, they support themselves. Leaves in the garden are a great accent because they're all slightly bluish, which contrasts with the rest of the greens in the garden. Once blooming only, very winter hardy, which isn't so much of an issue in the deep south. Up where we are, um, I'm zone 7A, so winter hardiness is a concern. It's not really an emergency. I never have to worry about winter kill on any of the albas. And the one, another thing about the albas is they're almost impossible to root from cuttings. I've tried and tried and tried and tried and tried. So air layering works best on these for me. Bellamore, an interesting color for an alba. But semi-double, show me your stamens and I'll love you forever. There we go. Celestial was among my very first purchase of roses. We had a nursery that was about an hour and a half from me called Shirando Roses. It was a, a retirement project for, for a man. And I would, I would make my list. I'd look at his roses and I'd make my list of things. And he would often take my list and say, no, you don't want that. Here, come let me show you this. And one he showed me was Celestial. And it's still in my garden um, from 2003 when I planted it. Never gets very big, but it is absolutely a stunning flower, and I love it. Madame Plantier. Many of us know Madame Plantier. She's a haystack. Little thing up over arch. Um, found an awful lot in old homes and in cemeteries in California, and I've been told by some of my California people that they believe it was probably used at least for a time as a rootstock, which would explain why you're finding it in various places. Because like we see Dr. Huey's out there where I am in the summer, 
chances are people didn't plant Dr. Huey. And in the case of many of these, chances are they didn't plant Madame Plantier. We do it on purpose now because she's such a wonderful, wonderful plant. Um, the one thing about her is I detect no fragrance in this rose at all. And I will say I can't smell most roses. If there's a light fragrance to it, I'm going to completely miss it. And that may have also fueled my love of old garden roses because I can smell most of them. Uh, Alba Maxima, very tall plant. This plant will easily do eight to 10 feet, 12 if you give it support. This particular photo was taken on a plant at Hollywood Cemetery. There, there are teas, there are chinas, there are noisettes, there's some polyanthas that have been planted there, and there's a number of modern roses and some ramblers. Completely out of place, near President's Circle there, is this tall blue-green rose. Very striking. And we've decided it's probably Alba Maxima. It's been declining the last few years, and I'm afraid that what's left is probably not going to survive. And in, in its case, it's very, very shaded. And generally, the once blooming old garden roses do well in a situation of deciduous shade because by the time they get their sun in the early spring when they're leafing out, and by the time the trees are fully leafed out and they're in shade, they've already fueled up. And chances are they're already blooming anyway because where I am, trees are usually fully leafed out by mid-May. And that's when my once bloomers are blooming. So I will often stick a once bloomer, whether it's a rambler or an old garden rose, into a shady situation. And that's the case with this one. But it's in almost 100% shade now from some deciduous shade, but also a couple of good-sized uh, magnolia grandifloras. So there's not much of it left at the cemetery. However, I tried and tried and tried to propagate this over the years. Every, every summer I would try to propagate it, and every year I would fail. Well, three years ago, almost as if by providence, this plant threw off a sucker. I always have my cutting kit, and in my cutting kit is a hand spade. So I carefully lifted that sucker, put it into a wet paper towel in a bag, and carried it home, and with great hope, but my plant is now six feet tall. So, the variety is preserved. Now, if I hadn't survived, we, you know, they sell Alba Maxima. I can order one. I can order one any day. But it's not the same. I want that one. And then we have the Centifolias. That's a really small group. And when I was researching this program years ago, I realized how few centifolias I grow. One. And how few there really are out there in the market. But we've all heard about cabbage roses. So in the case of the centifolias, they're about, they were the start of rose breeding. Because once hybridizers figured out pretty much the science of how you take this rose and that rose, and you can make new roses. The French and the Dutch ran with it. So the best roses in the 16th through the 18th century were coming from France and from the Dutch. And we already know the Dutch were doing all sorts of things with tulips and other plants. They were doing the same thing with roses. And in the case of the centifolias, they came from the Dutch. They are once blooming, super, super fragrant. And in this class, you can have ones that are this big and ones that are knee high. Centifolia major. This photo was taken in a public garden because I do not grow it, but I was absolutely stunned by this particular plant. That flower is this big around, and the scent will knock you down. And it really does. Look at it. It has that many flowers. Centifolia variegata, very, very similar, slightly different foliage, and like many of the other striped roses, every single one is different. And I'm fascinated by stripes, and I love this one. Fontaine Latour, we see that a lot on the show table, up where I am, 
because many of the modern rose people grow it because they have seen it on the show table. And I don't really care where people's motivation comes from. If you grow something because you've seen it on the show table, fine, put it in your garden. I don't care how many old garden roses get grown out there, but it introduces people to another facet of rose growing. And anything like that is good. So, uh, to piggyback on that, Tony, today's show has one old garden rose dowager queen entry and one Victorian shrubs entry. In the wow. Whole show. Based on where we are, I'm really not as surprised by that, but even up where I am, there's very, very few in the shows right now. Um, what were they? Green roses. Okay, green rose is always it. Always. Yeah. Yeah. And see, things like the green rose, they're a gateway drug. People like this, and then they find another one, and they find another one. Pompom de Bourgogne. If we have somebody French who can correct my pronunciation, I welcome it. I have a French friend who helps me with things when I see her. Um, this is the one, it suckers like crazy. It grows like a gallica, but it's not. It's only about this tall. Those flowers are about this big, and they're absolutely wonderful in the front of a bed. And this is, so this is the one that I grow. And then we have moss roses. Fascinated by moss roses. I love them. DNA has said that moss roses emerged as a sport or from centifolias. They came from centifolias. Um, and the mosses that we have right now are a combination of many, many, many different things. And the buds have that mossy projections on them. They're often sticky. And if you smell your fingers afterwards, it smells like pine salt. Yep. It's great. There are once blooming varieties, and there are repeat blooming varieties. Though they're not constantly blooming, they will give you some more flowers later. And again, not a concern for Florida, but very winter hardy on these. Crested moss has the most wonderful, wonderful buds. That's, it's, it's like feathers along the edge of the sepals. The flowers are nothing to write home about, I will tell you, but the buds are where the show is on the crested moss. Ari Martin is the one that most people know. Um, also, we've called it the old red moss, red moss, known by a number of different names. Extremely mossy, but also many of these with the extremely mossy also means extremely, extremely prickly. As in some of these are like wall-to-wall -wall thorns all the way down. My husband keeps a very, very white earth from these, and I always work in the garden in long sleeves, especially around these guys. Celery blooms. She blooms very, very well in the spring, and then in fall she'll throw you some flowers here and there. Striped moss and a little spider friend that I didn't see until I put this photo in the program years and years ago. Another one of those striped roses that are fascinating to see, and there's just something endearing about that muddled appearance of the petals when it opens completely. And white bath. This is one of the prickliest, mossiest roses that I have, and it reblooms fairly reliably toward the end of summer. And it's, there are not many white mosses. And now we get to the Asian OGRs. Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to put yourself into the position of rose growers in the late 18th century. Up until now, if you were a rose grower, you were well-to-do. Because if you had a garden, it was a subsistence garden and you ate from it. If you had a flower garden, chances are you had people who did that for you. So you were someone of means. And you loved your roses. They were fragrant. They bloomed, but they bloom only once. And here comes the China trade and 
the china roses and the tea roses start to come. And all of a sudden, you've got these flowers, that they, these plants that flower all the time. But I'll finish that story later. <coughs> they came from Southeast Asia. The traders brought it when the China trade opened up in the late 18th century. They were repeat blooming, clusters of flowers. They bloom all season long. Heat and humidity don't touch them. Up where we are, the hot, the humid, the horrible, no problem. And you can get from little beady guys. I collect miniature Chinas, so that's where, that's where your modern miniatures came from, miniature Chinas. So you've got everything from tea. Anybody grow sea? The flowers are that big. They're like a quarter to three eighths of an inch, and the plant is the size tiny tiny all the way up to climbers and large large shrubs the variety is incredible you can't start talking about china roses unless you talk about old blush okay <coughs> of the four stud china roses that we've all heard about this is the only one of the four that we can say yes this was the pink stud china the yellow the white the red they can only guess as to what they were Old blush, this is it, right here. Even though it was probably known in China well, well before 1793, that's kind of the acceptable date for when Western people have documented it. And we all know that history didn't exist before people in the West documented it, did it? <laughs> Archduke Charles, didn't know where exactly this came from, but DNA tests have shown that this is a sport of old blush. opens pink and gradually darkens to, to uh, dark pink and to red. I also grow a sport of old blush called single pink china. So imagine all of old blush in a single form. And that particular photo was taken in Hollywood Cemetery. There was a very, very nice, am I in your way? Okay. There was a very, very nice Archduke Charles there. and it's super easy to identify from a distance when it's in full bloom because there's pink flowers, dark pink flowers, red flowers all over it. It looks as if it's an old cheap rose catalog photo where they Photoshop stamp flowers in it, but it's real. <sighs> what did I just do? Mm -hmm. well, let's see okay, never mind. Okay. I figured there was a corresponding button. I just pushed it. Okay. Duche, wonderful, wonderful little shrub. Great for a suburban garden. Isn't it one of the earth kind roses also? Yes. It's not? It is. But it's, it's unusual to find a pure white china, and Duche is a great candidate. Louis Philippe, the red, what can we say about the red china? This is another case where it took modern rose hybridizers quite a while to introduce a color that had been known in Asia for centuries, that beautiful, beautiful dark to crimson red. And Louis Philippe is a, just an incredible example of it. Metabolis. Often, when I'm doing programs, especially for garden clubs, not necessarily rose societies, people aren't, generally don't do that to me. They'll, you know, someone will raise their hand and they'll say, what's your favorite rose? Almost as if they're taunting me. Without hesitation. Metabolus. This rose gives a lot more than I, to, than I ever give to it. Completely carefree. Almost always in bloom. Gorgeous in the garden. I can neglect it and it's fine. I remember to water it, I do not spray it, and it does this for me all the time. And I will tell you right now, that is the best photo I have ever taken of Metabolism. And I accidentally wrote over the original file, so it is watermarked forever. I do not have the original copy of this, so sorry about that. Peter won't eat it. Pardon? Peter won't eat it. Really? Nazi, 
I live out in the country, and toward the back of the property, we have deer. I refer to them as country deer. We have wary country deer, and then you've got the brazen suburban deer. We don't have that kind yet, fortunately. So the deer don't come up toward the house. They stay at the back of the property, and that garden gets eaten from time to time. But Metabolis grew on the south side of the house because I knew that it can be a bit frost tender where I am. So I live in a big brick house, so it, unobstructed southern exposure against that brick wall, and it's always been fine. And here we go with the miniature chinas, Rulettii. Um, it is old blush, exactly old blush, but it's this tall. And the flowers are about this big. Up where we are, there is a bit of a confusion in the garden show world. I have seen Rulettii twice on the head table at, gar at garden show rose divisions, and it's not. There are a couple of other miniatures that are similar but distinctly different, and then once you've seen them together, you know the difference. But it's, it's circulating through gardens, and I just call it not Rulettii. It's probably either Trinket or I don't remember what the other one is. The trinket or another one. Um, this is Roulette. I can put it side by side with Old Blush so that they're identical except for size. And it is these miniature chinas that gave the miniaturizing into the modern miniature roses. And if you look at older miniature roses, you can distinctly see the pointy china foliage in them. And then we have tea roses. Again, I love tea roses. They ask so little of us, and they give us so much more in return. Uh, medium, my Madame Antoine Marie, three and a half feet by about four feet. My Sofrano, big, big, big. Repeat to the point of constant blooming. Um, heat, humidity, breeze right through it. I don't spray my teas at all. Some of my chinas do require spraying. Where we are, Old Blush will um, black spot and defoliate without fungicide. I do it gladly, but my teas do not get, don't get fungicide. And they will, can be winter tender. Um, the first year I planted teas, I wasn't, I had no idea which ones would be winter tender, which one wouldn't, and we had a very hard winter, and I lost about half of them. But that's okay, it was more an opportunity to try different ones and not plant that kind again. Duchesse de Brabant, um, one of the little medium-sized ones. I have been told that it's very fragrant, but back to the fact that I can't smell most roses, I can't smell teas and chinas at all. For me, teas smell kind of like the old met childhood memory of bug spray, and that's not <laughs> particularly pleasant, so that's okay. This particular photo was taken in Hollywood Cemetery. There were four Duchesse de Brabant's growing at Hollywood Cemetery. So at some point it must have been pop a popular rose to plant in tribute to a loved one. Madame Antoine Marie, yet another gateway drug. I recommend, when I had my nursery, I recommended this rose to so many people because I knew <coughs> that the bud has a familiar look to people who are accustomed to growing modern roses. The size will never get out of bounds in their gardens where I am. Doesn't need it because it doesn't need fungicide. I fertilize it in the spring. Doesn't need pruning. Cut the dead stuff off, and it does this all year long. And then people would keep coming back for more because it is that good. Madame Lombard is another tea that asks very little. As you can see, that's a little spotty, but that is a fall photo. So the leaves are starting. They're starting to prepare to fall off for winter in the case of this one. Um, it's often found in cemeteries and old home sites and it's very difficult to identify because it's really, really variable. The way to do that, take cuttings, plant it in your own garden and put it with a known, a known plant. So this, this particular plant is at Hollywood Cemetery. The one that's in my garden came from a Confederate cemetery in downtown Fredericksburg.
where it's thriving down there with absolutely no care. And it's very little care in my own garden. But Madame Lombard, seven feet, easy. And the spread at the top is probably about six feet, wants to grow vase shaped. But the great thing about this is left to its own devices, it'll be like a multi trunk tree. So it's got the structural interest in addition to the flowers. And besides, when you, I hear an awful lot about the Chinese and its use. People say, well, it has weak necks. It doesn't hold up your flowers. If your bush is seven feet tall, you don't want the flowers straight up and down. You need it to come down so you can see them. White Maman Cochet is a big girl. Where I am, eight by eight by eight or more. But here we go, back to, I can show this photo to modern rose people. It's like, oh, I love that. Well, it'll open up to a muddled center, a confused center, as most tea roses will, but that's okay. The plant is absolutely stunning, and if you have a large spot in your garden and you want something that for a real presence, there it is. And Sofrano, my favorite tea rose ever, one of the oldest, 1839. So as soon as they started to get to, get to work with breeding tea roses, that's when Sofrano emerged, this beautiful creamy yellow on a tall plant. The first time I ever saw this was at Hollywood Cemetery. It was planted beside the gate in a lot that's enclosed by a wrought iron fence. Perfectly self-supporting. Arching over the gate as if it was on a structure, but it wasn't. With the view of the James River behind, through the gate, stunning, and I had to have it. And that day, I took cuttings of that particular plant because Oh, the gate was open. <laughs> the gate was open. And I propagated that plant, and it grows in my garden. It's about six feet tall in my garden, not quite as tall as, the, as it was there. That particular plant was, the plant at the, at the cemetery was knocked over by a falling tree a few years ago in a storm. And it started to re-sprout from, the, from the, the base. So it was good until it got rose rosette disease. So I had to have the cemetery staff remove it. But at, back to the same story, preserving the roses that you find, I, propag I had already propagated a new one from my plant at home. And we replanted it back in 2017. So it is a cutting of the original plant, planted in the original location, and it's thriving. But yes, Sophrona will always have a, a very special place here. And then we get to the modern hybrids. So you've got your European roses, you've got your Asian roses, and then the hybridizers got to work. And this is in approximate chronological order. Okay, I know I'm in front of an ARS crowd, and the ARS definition of hybrid China and the definition that we use in the heritage rose world are different. So what we're the definition that we're working with here is you're going to now imagine that you're back in the late 18th century and you're a nurseryman and your customers want repeat blooming roses and you got to do what you can do to get them. So back to what if you were in um, Connie's program earlier about remontancy as a recessive gene. Half, the, half both parents must carry that gene for it to combine to be remontant. So if you've got a once blooming old garden rose and you've got a china rose over here, that first generation is not going to be remodeled. It's going to have to be in the successive generations when you make repeated crosses. So the very early crosses of the china roses with the old garden European roses, once you know what you're looking for, are very distinct when you see them in the garden. Um, a lot of hybrid china roses are actually classed as gallicas. But when you find a rose that's classed as a gallica, and it's this high, that's not a gallica. But it has a strong amount of gallica in it. Also, there's ones that are classified as gallicas that have 
red new growth. So you see that, and it's like, come on, that's China, that's tea. It's in there. It may not be expressing itself strongly yet, but that's because it's an early cross. Most of these hybrid chinas are long and slender. They can be small climbers. They can be graceful arching plants. Very, very few prickles, a lot like the garlic is. They're kind of hairy prickles that stick in your finger. Make no mistake, but there's very few of them. Um, they've got the garlic colors, the pinks and purples and deep, 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 deep purples. And the thing about hybrid chinas is many of them were found Cemeteries, old home sites. I have found them on the side of the road. I'm not kidding. And just the historic value of it and the significance of where they began is probably what fuels my passion for them. The Bishop. There's a lot of roses out there. Four that Greg Lowry talks about that are, were named as the Bishop. This particular one was found in Calvert County, Maryland by Mrs. Keyes, who was a stalwart of the American Rose Society in the mid-20th century, did quite a bit of writing and quite a bit of documentation on roses up the East Coast where I am. So that's how I learned about her. And she found this rose at, at an estate, an old home site in Calvert County, Maryland. This rose for me has a significance of, when I had my, my nursery, People wanted fragrance, they wanted repeat bloom, et cetera. And what I would do, whatever roses I had available for sale, the nursery was at my garden. I would have flowers sitting sitting out so they could see them and didn't have to walk the garden if they didn't want to. And people wanted fragrance. And if you stick your nose in this rose, you will absolutely fall in love. And the color is great purple, and it tends to fade just slightly to a very delicate mauvey blue. And they stick their nose in this and go, like, oh, does this, does this repeat? And I wasn't going to apologize and say, no, it doesn't repeat. I said, come with me. You'll love it. And I you know, grab them and go into the garden and I would show them the mother plant. It's about 10 feet tall. Grows very, very easy to keep contained on an arch. And it's a great background for the repeat blooming roses that grow around it once this one finishes. But I will say, it's one of the first to start, almost always blooming for me. Early in the rose season for me is the end of April. And it always finishes in the middle of June. So you know, you've got eight full weeks of bloom out of this. So I can't ask a whole lot more of it. Hippolyte, another one that is an absolutely spectacular color. Same growth pattern, but you see a completely different flower. So that one, you saw the, you saw that kind of a, a flower form in the centifolias. So it's like, hmm, were you a centifolia? Were you a what? But just the tall, stringy growth habit of it immediately says hybrid china. Old Homestead, found rose again. And the person who found this must have been found in an old homestead. But you can see that the color is magenta, purple, blue, and that's, these photos are not altered at all. This is the color of this rose in the garden. This is a rose that I found. Um, I am known to stop my car and go see what I can see if I see an abandoned house. And there was an abandoned house on Tidewater Trail, which is Route 2 that runs through Fredericksburg and then goes on to um, on Richmond. And I saw it was growing beside the porch, so it obviously had been planted there. And big arching cane. It was growing in the shade, there were no flowers on it, but come on, we all know roses without flowers. So I snipped off one of the canes, tossed it like a javelin in the back of my car because it was big no trespassing sign. <laughs> <laughs> and I took it home and I made cuttings out of it. And I ended up with seven plants out of nine cuttings from that cane. So it rooted very, very well for me. I grew it for a while, and I had shown it to a lot of people, whether it was photos via email or in person. And what I found is that Doug Seidel told me that he found it in southeastern Pennsylvania in cemeteries and old house sites. Stephen Scaniello told me that he found it in Waretown, New Jersey. And I was sitting at a lunch at an old uh, Heritage Rose event in Dallas, Texas. And 
All of a sudden, a rose is dropped over my head onto my lunch plate. It was Stephen Scaniello. Someone local to the Dallas area had brought this flower with them to see if anybody could identify it. And he looked at it, and he, he said, does that look familiar? I said, it's Tidewater Trail. It's Ware Town Red. He says, it's growing in a cemetery in Dallas on one of these people's ancestors. So when you find an identical rose like that, what do we surmise? At some point, this thing was a known cultivar. But nursery catalogs at the time, just like nursery catalogs now, tend to kind of exaggerate things. So can we use the old descriptions to figure out what this was? I've got no idea. All I know is that it's, it's a piece of unknown history that grows in the garden. And this one, um, it grows in my garden. Now, I will tell you, three years ago, I, wanted, I was out that direction. I don't go through that, through that part of town very often. But three years ago, Steve and I were on our way home from Richmond. And I said, let's go see if Tidewater Trail's still there. He's always so nervous about me when I look at that. So he says, I'm going to wait in the car. <laughs> so he says, the next thing he knew, I was gone. I had just, it was a wire fence. I just, you know, limboed through the wire fence and went through the brush. It was gone. So the, the house is completely surrounded by overgrowth. So it was no surprise that the road was completely shaded out and it was outcompeted by the blackberries and other stuff that was growing around it. But it's like, all right, I grow this, sorry the original is gone. And as I'm coming back, there's a car parked behind my car. And there's a lady talking to Steve through the car window. I was like, oh crap. <laughs> it turns out that was her grandparents' house. She lived up the road and she was on her way home and she needed to, she wanted to stop and make sure that we weren't doing something that we weren't supposed to be doing. Well, we were, but not in a bad way. <laughs> and, you know, I set my hand out, I introduced myself, and you know, I apologize for trespassing, but I did have good reason. And I told her, I said, but do you remember the rose that grew by the porch here? And she said, oh yeah, that red one, it smells so good. Mm -hmm. Yes, I gotcha. And we talked for a little while. As it turns out, I had two of them that I lifted from suckers of my plant. She has it back now. So the rose that grew beside her grandparents' front porch, she now has it. Back with its family. Ah, uh, Shaler's Provence. As much as I adore the story behind Tidewater Trail, Shaler's Provence and I are family. Um, I was first given, I first found it at an old home site. I was then given it by a friend who collected cuttings at a cemetery. And I have collected it six more times since then. In cemeteries, there was one at a flower bed in the parking, next to a parking area in downtown Fredericksburg. Got it from there. Um, I've gotten it on the side of the road three times where it must have just suckered and escaped from a garden, just following the sun as things overgrow, because it does sucker regularly, politely, and it's relatively thornless, so it's no big deal to deal with. But whenever I see it, it's almost like finding a long lost cousin. It's, it, it starts earlier than the bishop does, so they're within a day or two of each other, and it finishes well after the bishop finishes. Um, lilac pink flowers, lighter on the reverse, almost no purples at all, <laughs> matte green foliage, large shrub, small climber, does not matter. Um, the one of the Shaler's Provence that I grow in my front garden has an accidental combination. I have uh, Moonlight, the white hybrid musk growing on one side of the big cherry tree, and I have Shaler's Provence on the other side. And when I planted it there, I didn't know what it was. I just know that I got the original cutting underneath the tree, so I planted it underneath the tree. I knew it grew well there. Moonlight, a couple of years ago, threw a cane up over and through the crotch of the cherry tree into Shaler's Provence. So, if you see the cover of my book, that is the accidental combination of Shaler's Provence and Moonlight, and it's, it's kismet, literally, <laughs> serendipity. 
if I may just add. Sure. Um, I found that rose. Really? And, and my great granddaughter's yard uh, in San Angelo, Texas, where maintenance consisted of my hand smelling. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and I've since found it in, in a number of places. And it's <coughs> fabulous. One of the mysterious things about this is. Shearer's Provence almost never produces hips, so it's not as if these things are seedlings. So often we find you know, seedlings out there, whether it's in our garden or somewhere out in the wild, but that's not the case with Shaler's because there's no hips on it. And if it does form hips, they just dry up and there's no seeds in them. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, now we get to the noisettes. This is where history is really, really being made. Um, up until now, you had the hybridizers taking a once blooming rose and crossing it with a repeat blooming rose and successive generations to get repeat. John Champneys, whether he did it on purpose or not, did something genius. He took two repeat blooming roses and combined them together. He took all blush and musgrove species. And in that, he created noisettes, and they were a sensation in the second quarter of the, of the 19th century. Nurserymen could not produce them quickly enough, at least in the US, because people really, really wanted them. The upright was talking with someone earlier today about Champney's pink cluster. I can always identify that because of the, um, the foliage is very China. The buds are slim like China, and it is stick straight upright. Where often the successive generations of noisettes tend to be bushier and they and bushier and more graceful and arching. Very, very fragrant. I can say this because I can smell them. I can smell them at a distance, and I love them for that. Only Rose Classy was developed in America. All the others came from somewhere else. Except miniatures. Ralph Moore had a big hand in that, and he's American, so I may have to change this. And many, many mystery noisettes have been found. Cemeteries, old home sites, in all sorts of different places. And the thing about noisettes is they're incredibly difficult to identify because not only were they producing new plants from cuttings and producing genetically ident identical clones, Nursery room would also plant seeds and sell it as whatever the mother plant was. I have had noisettes come up in my garden as just accidental seedlings. So he hesitate before you throw an identity on something just because it looks familiar. It might not be. Uh, Champney's pink cluster, where it all started. Look at those buds. See how long and slim they are? Easy, easy way to identify it when you see it. Nasturana, later one. But the thing about Nasturana is it's got the old noisette form where the flowers are kind of semi-double and it's shrubby. And it's, a, it's, a, it's great in the garden, very, very, very fragrant. Cesar Noisette, this is a found rose. It was a very, very interesting story. Um, the provenance behind Cesar Noisette is it was propagated in California and introduced back into the nursery trade. But the story is that it originated with a family in Virginia who carried it as they moved across the country from Virginia to Missouri to Arkansas to California. And the reason that I fell in love with that is because that's where my, my family did. Virginia, in their case, Kentucky, Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma to California. So. This rose made the same journey my family did. So I had to have it. I paid $69 for it at a California rose auction. It was a fundraiser. And I adore it. Will we ever know what it is? Probably not. It's just a white, a tall white noisette. But that's okay. It's got a story. Alistair Stella Gray. Um, this is a climber. But it's also a climber that I don't need to tie because it's very, very stiff. Mine's 12 feet tall, growing up the side of my house. Very, very, it's not attached to anything. It's just going straight up. 
at some point it's probably going to fall over into everything that's in front of it. But for right now, I just want to see how tall this one would get. Easily available in the nursery trade. But my particular cutting came from, once people know you collect roses, they offer you roses. A lady emailed me and says, there's this rose that my neighbor has growing on her house. She took cuttings of it out the second story window of her neighbor's house. I had to have it. <laughs> Crepuscule, climbing tea, nice mannerly climber that's the most gorgeous pale orange. In the sunlight, colors of sunset, absolutely gorgeous. Manetti. Manetti is the Dr. Huey of the 19th century. Its claim to fame is that it was an incredibly popular rootstock. It's also a once bloomer which is weird in the noisettes. So if I find Minetti out there, just as if we see Dr. Huey out there, chances are that person didn't plant Minetti, just like that gardener did not plant Dr. Huey. Whatever Minetti was grafted to died and Minetti took over. Yeah? Minetti. Also, there are two instances of it at Hollywood Cemetery, and one instance in another cemetery that I know of, where in both cases, the chances are it's been stopped. And a little friend, a little flower fly. And then we get the Portlands. There's not many Portlands. And you start naming Portland. Name of Portland. Rose Rush. But it was developed by crossing Autumn Damask with other rose classes. Another repeat blooming rose, even though it doesn't repeat as much as the Asian roses do. Smaller shrubs. My rose direct is this high. One of my oldest roses. I planted it in 2005. That big. But they repeat and they're knock you down fragrant. Here we have rose direct. I planted this rose in 2005. I found the receipt for it. I was digging through some stuff while we're kind of getting rid of stuff. I bought it from Jackson Perkins. I ordered it at a Fredericksburg Rose Society group order in 2005. Portland from Glendora. Tall rose, fragrant rose. Um, this has been, this is the subject of my very first disqualification in a rose show. I submitted that photo. I was disqualified for side bugs. I was also disqualified because it didn't have an AEN. At that point, they were calling it Josine Hane, I think, and that's how I put it. But I was using an older version of the Little Rose book for the identity, and it didn't appear in the new book, so they disqualified me. They could have disqualified me twice, but they just got me for for side buds on that. And that's when I started to get incense because I'm sorry, OGRs are not disqualified for side buds. Over here, they're not. <laughs> Sidonia has exactly the same growth habit as Portland from Pandora. This one most definitely was bred by V. Bear in France. So, do we think that perhaps the other is a V. Bear rose? with similar parentage, absolutely no way to know, but it's fascinating to think about things like that. Indigo. It's a weird little one. Um, I'll never be without it. I swear I will never be without this rose. It's only knee high. And it suckers like a gallica, where it will send out a sucker, come up and put flower on the end of it, like this. There's always, a I, I put it in a spot where I knew it was going to sucker, and it can sucker as much as it wants. And if it gets out of bounds, it just means that I have some to share with other people because this is hard to find. And that's its color. It's purple and it fades to blue, just like indigo. It's gorgeous. And I would say it's fragrant, but you have to get on your hands and knees to smell it because it's so small. But fascinating, and look at that matte foliage. 
And then we got the bourbons. We're starting to get the ones that we recognize. The original bourbon, the cross between Rosa Chinensis and Rosa Damascena, and it came from bourbon, the Ile de Bourbon, which is now what? The Union Island? It's in the Indian Ocean, which was a site of trade. It's a stop off trade location. So it makes perfect sense that roses would come from there because they developed there and then they went off to be sold to the Europeans. The bourbons that we know now, sort of like the moss roses, this is hybridizers getting to work with the original bourbons from Bourbon Island with other things to put in other characteristics. Um, repeat, absolutely. Fragrant, you bet. We've got everything from smallish. This one is sort of like the Chinas, where there's just about every size available in bourbons. Souvenir de la Malmaison. Everybody I know grows that rose except me. <laughs> the reason is, for whatever reason, it hates living in my garden. It would grow beautifully during the growing season, and then in the winter, a third of it would die. And then it'd grow back again, and then another third of it would die. Every winter, I was cutting off and cutting off and cutting off. And one year, I lost more than half of it, and I just thought, you know, it's time to just euthanize you done with it. The weird part about it is, I also grow Souvenir de St. Anne's, which is a semi-double sport of this, that is Souvenir de la Malmaison in every other way except for flower form, and she performs beautifully. So I like to think that perhaps I just had an anomaly of a plant in Souvenir de la Malmaison, but to be honest, I don't love it enough to buy it again. I'll keep souvenir to St. Anne's, and this is a pleasant memory. Madame Isaac Perrier, we see that a lot on the show tables because she's such a good garden rose, and she does really, really well in the old garden rose competitions and rose shows. Vergata di Bologna, uh, she's a martyr to black spot in my garden. <laughs> Nothing black spots faster than Varagata de Bologna, I'm gonna tell you right now. But the flowers will draw you in from across the garden because they are that gorgeous. And then you get there and they're that fragrant. And what's really cool is if you grow it long enough, your plant is probably gonna get a reversion in it. And I've done a lot of reading about this one. The breeding of this is well documented. <coughs> It's not, a, it's not a striped sport, reverted to the sport parent. But one of, the, one of its parents was a sport. So what they think is it probably is reverting back to uh, two generations back. It's out there in the nursery trade as Veragata di Bologna Rouge. Zephyrine Drouin. Um, been continuously available in the nursery trade since 1868 when it was introduced. Um, another martyr to black spot. This is one of the few times I probably photographed it when it did not have black spot. The plant bloomed very little for me. It had profuse bloom in the springtime and then almost nothing afterwards. It threw out basil canes like they were going out of style. Um, it finally got rose rosette disease, and I was mercifully able to dig it up without a you know, hit to my conscience. The flip side of this is Kathleen Harrop, a pale pink sport of Zephyrine Druin. What I disliked about Zephyrine Druin is not in this plant. <laughs> Much more resistant, blooms all year long, easier to maintain. It's an absolute stellar plant for me. And this year, she's put in a few flowers that were like half and half, where it was dark pink on one part and light pink on the rest of it. So Zephyrine was still making herself known. And I real quick cut that off because I do not want Zephyrine back in my garden. She does not deserve space in there. <laughs> And then we get to the hybrid perpetuals. This is, this is where 
for rose breeders finally can say, yes, look what we did. And just about the time when the hyper perpetual started to come and be popular is when rose shows became the thing to do. And hybrid perpetuals led, lent themselves to being superstars in early growth shows. The, the tall upright plants, fungal diseases, I'm sorry, if you love them, you spray fungicide and you don't apologize for it. They're fabulous. And they're repeat flowering, some to a greater extent than others, but you still will have flowers multiple times per year on them. And they're fragrant. This is the epitome in my mind, Frau Karl Druschke. Um, for decades, Frau Karl Druschke was the best white rose in existence. And everyone kept saying that. And its only flaw is that it has no fragrance. And not just to me, they wrote that at the time. Um, John Hopper, the exact opposite probably the most fragrant rose that my, my, I have a dear rose friend Rick. he said this is the most fragrant rose in my garden and I can smell this one absolutely incredibly sweet rose fragrant tall arching plant blooms a lot black spot yeah but we know this going into the day so spray fungicide on it and enjoy it Marquesa Bocella Strange little thing, not characteristic of the other hybrid perpetuals, maybe should go into, it's more like a Portland because of size and bloom have it, but that's okay, believe her in the hybrid perpetuals, that's where she is, she's happy there. When I did, when I do propagation clinic, she's one of the roses that I use because I get a, almost 100% take on cuttings on her. She is that easy to root, so if you wanna to learn to root roses and you know someone who grows Marquesa Bocella, go pay them a visit. El Nero, exact opposite of uh, Marquesa Bocella. Tall, voluptuous, huge foliage, huge flowers. Powerfully, powerfully fragrant. Black spot, yeah, that's okay. And Renda Violette, when you're talking about fragrance, Renda Violette, she takes it for me. Um, I grow mine as a small climber and for a little while, one of the nurseries was selling a virus indexed version of it because up until that particular time, just about every single Renda Violet in the nursery trade had mosaic virus, which up where we are, it does affect the vigor and it does affect the performance of the plant. Not so much as in colder areas where it really can affect the survival of the plant. For me, it's just the vigor and the performance. And I have two plants of it. I have an older one and then I have the virus indexed one. And I'm being as objective as I can about it, but I honestly do think that the virus index one performs a lot better than the, uh, than the other one. So there we go. We have looked at old garden roses from ancient times through the Middle Ages, through the Renaissance, through the American colonies, and then came La France. Now, 1867 was just, was a sign in arrears, but it was introduced in 1867 and is very, very different than anything that had come until then. The petals are silky. There are a bazillion of them in that flower. It's voluptuous and when it opens, it's a thing of beauty. This is what a hybrid tea rose used to be. They were big, they were voluptuous, they were gorgeous. But tastes changed. And by the middle of the 20th century, we started to get a slightly different shape, that exhibition triangle with the pointy center and everything that the hybrid tea grower aims to have. And this became that. I'm with you. But I did grow moonstone. I really did. I grew it on its own roots and form. Just figured I'd let you know. But it way, 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 way better plant. And modern roses have their have their own appeal. But this is where they came from. And now you know.
You've been listening to the Rose Chat Podcast with Chris Van Cleve and Teresa Byington, expert rose gardeners who want to help you achieve the rose garden of your dreams. Don't miss an episode. Listen anytime on our website at rosechatpodcast.com or listen on the go via the Rose Chat app on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Share this podcast with your social networks and join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram by using the hashtag Rose Chat. Join us next time for another edition of the Rose Chat Podcast. The Rose Chat Podcast is a production of the Rose Chat Media Group, Birmingham, Alabama.